Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. My guest today is Paree Garg. Paree is a partner at Oliver Wyman in their health and life sciences practice. Hi, Paree. Thanks for being here today. Hello. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So the topic today is health disparities. And the reason why I picked this topic is because DEI is top of mind for every single employer that we work with. And then when you start to really dig in on DEI and think about it from a benefits perspective, health disparities is one of the areas where I feel like we still have so much work to do. Um, on the employer side, as it relates to benefits, we're looking at affordability and we're looking at unmet needs. But I want for you and I to focus on health disparities. And so to start, can you give us some insights into what the health plans are doing to tackle health disparities? Yeah, it's a great question, Tracy, and a very timely topic, right? One of the realities with health disparities is that until the pandemic hit, most people knew that there was a disparity um, in how individuals accessed and were able to almost process healthcare into outcomes, but nobody really did anything about it till the pandemic threw everything into stark perspective. And so what we're seeing now are two things that are actually pushing health plans along this path as well. So first, as I'm sure you guys know, um, one side of the business that plans cover is the commercial side of the business, such as your clients, right? ASO accounts or fully insured accounts. And then on the other side are government programs. And within government programs, CMS is making big strides in terms of pushing our plans towards thinking a lot more about health equity and how they tackle some of the disparities that exist today. Historically, the focus has been just on collecting information and even that is very difficult because a lot of individuals, you know, you have that box in the enrollment form that asks you what race you are. Some people check it, some people don't. Others asked provider organizations to help gather some of that information and report it. And again, sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. But historically, that's been the focus. And now what we're seeing importantly is the focus shifting from collecting the data to actually moving into outcomes. And we've seen some very, very interesting patterns. So in South Florida, as an example, um, about 30% of the population is uh, Hispanic. And within that population, we see a much higher incidence of cancer than we see in the non-white Hispanic and even African-American populations. Um, second thing we'll notice, and this is a well-known statistic, right? Uh, birth outcomes of African-American women tend to be much worse than those of their um, both non-white, non-Hispanic whites and Hispanic counterparts. And so really now plans are thinking through, okay, how do I take that data? How do I analyze the data by race to see, is there a difference in the actual outcome? So for um, birth outcomes, as an example, right, there are three or four things that folks look at. So uh, preterm labor is one, low birth weight individuals is another, and then the number of days spent in the NICU is the third. And the difference is pretty stark. So once you have that data, you can't just sit on it, right, then you need to do something about it. So then on the heels of that, what do you do? Do you have targeted campaigns? that are reaching out to African-American women? Do you have racially and linguistically appropriate communications that help them understand what they're doing? Do you help them hook up with the right types of doctors that will serve their needs from a cultural, racial, and language perspective? So that's where we're seeing health plans headed. It's early days yet. And I can't say that all of them have this figured out. I actually think none of us have it figured out quite yet. But that's where we're going. So the data piece is an incredibly, incredibly important part to help guide the right intervention. So from, a, from an employer-sponsored health plan perspective, the focus tends to be on two things. The first is access. So I know employers are starting to ask better questions about the composition of the networks. Does your network match up with 
the, the p- kind of people that are in my population? Can they find somebody that looks like them, talks like them, that they can relate to? That, that's important. I don't know how hard or easy that is. Um, perhaps you could comment on what the health plan focus is, just even on this access issue. Mm-hmm. It's a great question. And actually, with a lot of the state Medicaid plans, they're already asking for this level of information, right? To help us see the racial, ethnic, language diversity that exists in your provider network. So plans should be collecting the data already today. So it should not be a huge lift for them to start reporting it out for your clients also. In fact, I think it's very important. We know that individuals feel much more comfortable going to physicians or nurses that look like them and talk like them. That's documented fact. And in fact, one of the other things that we've discovered is people feel more comfortable going to a physician if the physician looks welcoming in the picture as well, right? If they're smiling or not. And so those things do make a difference. I absolutely think that if you were to ask plans for that level of information, it's something that if they don't already have access to it, they should be well on their way to building it. And you should demand it from them. Absolutely. Okay. And then the second um, tool, if you will, that employers have is their plan design. So how they cover various services or special programs that they add in, you know, for example, a centers of excellence, or maybe there's a direct primary care arrangement or whatever. Um, And, you know, um, some feel like, um, you know, that telemedicine and virtual care has helped expand access Although, you know, um, there's also the big argument that not everybody has broadband access, not everybody has an updated um, cell phone to be able to take advantage of some of these programs and have them work properly. And so what is your advice for employers um, beyond looking at access, but as they think about their plan designs and any special programs that they Mm -hmm. have, what can they do to better support those with health disparities or to help break down the barriers around that? Great question. And so I'll go back to, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, I talked a little bit about how important it is to focus on health outcomes Mm -hmm. and to look at health outcomes by race, ethnicity, and language. And then, you know, some people will throw disability in there as well. And so really taking a look at outcomes and designing programs around those is the most important thing. Um, I hate to say it, but I do think it's a reality. A lot of us have preconceived notions in terms of what access looks like or what outcomes look like, in particular uh, racial and ethnic and and language segments. In fact, I'll give you an example. Um, We did this program with a health plan where individuals assumed that folks that walked in and had a um, Spanish accent, Spanish speaking accent would want materials in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's not the case. Um, People were sometimes insulted that, what do you think I can't speak English or I can't read English just because I'm coming to you and I have a little bit of an accent. And so, you know, there are preconceived notions that we walk into just all spheres of life with. And so if you let the data do the talking and say that you discover that, yes, you know, there is a disparity in the number of Spanish speaking individuals that have a PCP versus not, right, then embarking on a program that targets those individuals and says, okay, look, here are all the reasons that you want to have a PCP, have the front of the flyer in Spanish and the back of the flyer in English, so that you're not making any uh, calls in terms of how they prefer to receive their information. Those kinds of things are ones that we have seen actually make a difference. The other thing that has proven very powerful, and it's okay, I think, to ask the plans where they are with this, is collaboration with certain um, uh, organizations that exist in the community, right? So some communities have an African Voices um, organization. There are several churches that cater to say the Korean population and really partnering with them to figure out what will work and what won't work has proven to be very, very successful for a couple of the plans that I've worked with. So I think it's okay to ask for that. I actually think it's important to ask for that. 
Wow. So this is a lot of good food for thought for employers. Is there anything else you want to add to the list? I feel like we've covered some good topics, but any any other um, advice for employers? One other one. Um, and, you know, we talked, Tracy, about the provider network and the makeup of the provider network. The other thing that's equally important that sometimes gets missed in all of this is actually the makeup of the, of the plan itself, mm-hmm. right? So what does the care management staff at the health plan look like, as an example, right? And so that's a service that you're purchasing from them in your market. You want to know that the care managers that are picking up the phone and answering calls from your employees are able to access people that think like them, people that talk like them, people that are able to speak the same language. In fact, with one of the plans that we recently worked with, um, we listened to a recording of a member call in Spanish. And the individual was more happy about the fact that he was able to communicate his issue in Spanish and then get care than the fact that he got access to care. So, you know, it's, it's, it's being human in, in today's world. And so that piece is the other important thing to understand and push for as you look to mitigate uh, health inequity that exists in our system today. Well, these are great suggestions. And, you know, I like that they're they're pretty grassroots. They're pretty basic as you think about what does the network look like? You know, what what do the what do the people look and sound like that the plan members are calling into? What kinds of things have the carriers done at a very local level to try to build the right relationships and really understand what's going on within some of these communities? All just really, really great advice. So um, thank you so much for joining us and hope to have you back again. I'm sure that we would never run out of topics to talk about. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated.